What's up, world? This is Awo Fafore. What's going on, good people? This is Awo Osheun. Welcome back to the Who Made Y'all Priest podcast, where we talk about our spiritual journeys, our everyday life experiences, and the issues of the time from the from the perspective of two people who just happen to be priests. Fafore, what's going on, man? Man, same old, same old. <laughs> you sound like me now. Right, <laughs> right, like right. What's going on with you? How you feeling? Man, you know, I'm feeling I'm feeling amazing, man. I see you uh you popped up with the magenta shirt on, man. So, you know, I'm feeling uh bright and bubbly and fuzzy and you know, lions, yeah. tigers, and bears on my. Yeah, I'm trying to tap into my um using the vibration of colors to to keep me, you know what I'm saying, in in good spirits. Yeah. Good spirits. Now you said you're amazing. Are you amazing for real? Yeah, I feel good, man. I feel good. It could be uh, worse. Oh. I don't like that outlook. You know, <laughs> we both are in tune with the universe. And it's a it's a personal year seven for us. And it's a universal year seven. I'm a life passer. Man, this year been kicking my ass a little bit. Mm. Like I had to just, about like, you know, I knew, you know what I'm saying? Cause astrology, excuse me, numerology is my thing. I knew this year was going to be, uh, be different. So people used to ask me about, you know, what's going on? I'm like, man, I just, just want to move to a mountain, to a crib on top of a mountain for the, for the rest of the year. Mm. And this was even before the year started. So I knew, so like spirit is messing with me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the spirit is messing with me a little bit. They they pushing me or trying to push me in a direction that I signed up to go into before I got here. Mm. And I'm going reluctantly. And yeah, they messing with me a little bit. You know. Uh seven, that seven is a very introspective, very spiritual energy. And I don't know, I just feel like, I feel like I haven't honored that energy because it's supposed to spend a lot of a long time. Mm. And I don't really have a long time. You know, I have very little alone time. And I've really felt this year, like I really kind of want to be by myself, just be alone and mm with my thoughts and things of that nature to read and study and all that. And then we talked about this a couple of times. I was you know, talking to you not too long ago. It was like, man, I ain't picked up like a book, like, and for real, just read a book in a while. You know, and I got books here that I need to read. I just ordered about three or four more, you know, two of them are more, you know, study type of thing then you just kind of read through it type of deal but man i haven't really read anything you know i just was thinking we over halfway through, about halfway through the year i've only been on the plane twice you know mm -hmm. to egypt and to miami and i'm like a double digit you know plane trip type of person for a long time now. And it's like, yo, I haven't even been doing that. Like, yeah, it's, it's a lot, man. It's a lot. So do you feel like you honored the energy of the year last year in your year six when, uh, you know, that year six talking about uh, spending time with family and those type of things? Do you feel like you honored your, uh, that energy last year? Yeah, I definitely honored the energy last year. There's a little bit more that I 
could have done, probably should have done. But I think I did a pretty good job in honoring that energy last year. You know, I it's difficult done, to find. Go ahead. I'm just saying I haven't done that same thing this year. You know, it's kind of difficult uh, to find that balance when you have family. When you got a family at home, it's difficult to find that balance, especially when you got a regular nine to five. You know, you're trying to do other things on the side, trying to do uh, what you've been called to do, trying to do some some other things. Like you say, read, study, those type of things. It seems like it's not enough time in the day. Uh, I just think we got to start uh, carving out not big chunks of time, but quality time when we want to spend a long time, when we want to uh, be able to sit down, say, for an hour and just read or just study you know, trying to get that, uh, get that time. You know, I'm able and fortunate to be able to steal that time at work. So we're going to keep that between <laughs> me and you though. <laughs> right. Right. Absolutely. We keep that on the under. As we say. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. I find myself checking up on all my, you know, life past sevens this year, checking up on seeing how they're doing and how they're managing. And it's really like a, a similar response to them. Um, than I have, there's just like, you know, haven't really had the time to be alone and do this and do that. So yeah, it's kind of across the board. So I'm in a space now where I'm like, okay, I'm halfway there. And I don't want to look back in January to be like, yo, I really smoked that. So I'm really trying to dedicate myself. Cause Spear right now is, is kind of trying to throw a little chaos in the game. They're like, all right, we, Try to get you to get there on your own, mm. but uh, you didn't. So now we're going to have to stir some things up. And I'm like, ooh, I don't like how y'all stir. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, know, uh, right. you know, every time I go to Spirit or especially my ancestors, I'll say, hey, look, help me with this or help me with that. But don't do it in like a reckless type of way. Like I don't need the house to burn down. Right. Or lose my job. I don't need nothing all like that. Just you can subtly tell me. <laughs> and they like now nah, we've been trying to suddenly tell you and you haven't been listening so you know now spirit is kind of ratcheting up its way of trying to get my attention so let me ask you this man. nine years ago right mm -hmm. when you were in a year uh when you were in a year seven again mm -hmm. but this is before uh you gaining the knowledge of numerology are you able to go back then and say that that was a struggle that year also no see that wasn't a struggle that was when i came into you know uh, consciousness basically mm -hmm. like when that really really came into consciousness that's when i changed my diet and you know went vegan that was a it was a great year it was some some dark places for the lack of a better word when i got to a place of obtaining all this information and then trying to share it with people who couldn't see what i saw and didn't know what i knew and they couldn't get with it so that was a struggle right so i there was times when i felt a way about this like y'all just not getting it but at some time during that year I kind of came to myself where it was like, well, look, man, that's on them. You, you I almost have to, to mourn for those that were close to me mm -hmm. and say, all right, I didn't, I didn't have my time. I didn't mourn for them. Now let me just go on and, and live the life that I know that I'm being called uh, to lead. And then, you know, if they, if they watch me and see what I'm doing and then they decide later on, oh, let me jump on the bandwagon. Cool. If they don't, then, you know, that's fine too. You know, they're adult, that's their journey. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, so it was, looking back, it was a really dope year. It did have these moments, but I'm grateful for those moments because it helped propel me forward, right? It was that space of having to detach emotionally from certain things and, and really understand what you could control and what you couldn't. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, man, that's a great outlook to have, man. 
Yeah, man, I'm trying, man. I'm trying to grow one day at a time. But uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to get it double speed now because, yeah, Spear not playing no games. You know. And I got to take right. about six more trips right, before right, the right. end of the year so to make up for uh, <laughs> <laughs> what I have been doing. Right, right, right. We about to get out. We about to get out of here, man, and go to VA, man, and spend some time with the people. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah. me too. That's me too. looking forward to that. So what we got today, man? What, who we, what we got today, man? What we doing today? What we talking about today? So today y'all get a chance to meet the man who on episode one actually did the prayer for us to start this season on a great, great foot. So we're going to get into it. It's going to be some powerful information. We're going to talk about the school system and our children. Because uh, wasn't it Whitney who said the children are the future? Teach them well and let them lead the way. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, man. Right. Yeah. Let's get into it, man. Let's All right. Let's go. <laughs> A boy, a boy, yeah, I will. A boy, I told, surely, what he will fool my brothers. Good to see y'all, man. Good to see you. We're glad to have you, man. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to come chop it up with our woes, man. With the young, with the youngest, I will. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. We really appreciate you, man. We appreciate you coming on with us. And not only that, though, we appreciate you because we were just telling the people that now they get to see the face behind the voice. Who did the opening prayer in season I one? I say. So we greatly appreciate that. I say, man. It's um nah, man. It's it's been wonderful to see you see you brothers um step into y'all's ministry. You know what I mean? I by, by by bringing the message um to the people through through various lenses, man. I think it's important over here in the diaspora, because so many people get caught up in you know, just the staunch thing of what they think a priest is. Now, like, man, we 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 got to deal with the day to day. We got families, we got jobs, we have things that we have to manage um, through all of these lenses. And as priests, we do have takes and opinions on these things, and uh, and we do mm -hmm. see things in a different light than most people might see. And we do have different opinions um, that we may or may not share with uh, with the with the common populace. I right. sure. I sure. Right. right. So as we start this off, as we always do, we want you to introduce yourself to the people. Tell us who you are. Tell us what you do. Uh, well, first of all, greetings to all Aboro Aboye, Abo Shishe. I am Awo Ifalolu Obatunde Ifayemi. I am first and foremost a uh, husband and father of three. Um, I am a priest of Ifa. I am a priest of Obatala. I um, am a diviner. Um, I am uh, in the lane of study um, and experiencing what Ifa is, what it can be um, on this side of the water for uh, for us for us. Uh, brothers and sisters who are reclaiming this medicine for our families. I see. Um, I'm also a school teacher. Uh, I teach English. I've been in the classroom for about nine years. I have been working with young people for a total of about 20 plus years. Um, education was my last stop. Before then, I worked for uh, Dallas County Juvenile. I've worked for um, various nonprofits. Um, all dealing with mentoring and um, upliftment of children. I say, I say, that's beautiful. Yeah. So, as is customary on the Who Made Y'all Priest podcast, we always talk about our spiritual journeys. How do we get to E five? So, tell us a little bit about your spiritual journey and what that trajectory was like getting to E five. Wow. Um, I, I, uh, my walk with E five. Um, starts at childhood mm -hmm. um having experiences um that you know our elders just normally wouldn't have the expressions for the experience to explain um you know so many of us are just you know branded with um our elders experience like they were taught what their parents were taught and they were taught what their parents were taught and so on and so coming up, man, um, being a young person and 
seeing things, hearing things, um, but no one to talk to about it. You know, you begin you, you begin you question your sanity. You begin to think about, um, you know, is something wrong with you as a person? Um, mm-hmm. And I went silent, man. I didn't tell anybody my experiences. I didn't tell nobody, you know, what I was feeling, what I was seeing, what I was hearing. I didn't want to be labeled as anything. I didn't want to be seen as an outcast. Um, it wasn't until I was 17 years old when I finally had some experiences that was so so wild that I finally broke and spoke to my grandmother. And, you know, mm-hmm. even though she was a devout Catholic, them grandmamas just had that juju they be knowing, you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. I had some experiences where I was experiencing um some contact with some with some with some ancestors. At that time I had no idea what it was. Um and she was like, baby, stop fighting it. You know what I mean? Just just listen to it. And that moment changed everything mm-hmm. for me at the age of 17. Um, I realized that um I was tapped into something um that was terrifying but exciting at the same time. And that led me on a path to want to know what this was, what I was experiencing. What is this thing past the five senses that has made its way into onto my path? And so it just led me down a um it led me down a path of study. Um, you know, just like most folk, that study began in the Bible. Um and I never really was a church going person, you know. New Orleans is real good for them, uh, them, them Sunday, them summer Sunday schools. So mm-hmm. you know, we would hit them up at summertime when we was kids. But man, it was just all about warm donuts and chasing girls back then. <laughs> um, but um, but no, man. Um, just along along my path of study, um, because I wasn't firmly rooted in a spiritual tradition, I had a much more broader um view of mm. what the contents of the Bible uh, were. And I had a lot, I, had a, I, I took different opinions and I took different insights um, because for me, it was all about connecting dots. It wasn't just about completely digesting that one text. And so in that, um, I went from reading the Bible to reading the Torah, to reading the Quran and just like, that was the basis of what I had known at that time. That was the that was the extent of my spiritual awareness was those Judeo Christian, you know, uh, avenues. And in my studies, you know, you go through the text, you go through the Bible, and there was an occurrence that caught my attention. It's like there's one place in the Bible that's mentioned more than any other place, forty seven times to be exact, and that's Egypt. And so I'm like, okay, what is this connection? Why is this one place mentioned so many times in the Bible, right? And so that led me down the path of studying ancient Kemet. And that was really Mm -hmm. what just cracked the calabash for me um, when it came to really understanding the power and wisdom that our ancestors held in antiquity. Um, And so that, that led to a deep... six to seven year period where I would just indulge myself in anything having to do with any type of uh, writing text philosophy um, of ancient Kemet. Mm -hmm. Um, And in that, in that spiritual awakening, the bottom fell out. Um, It was in New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina in 2005, right uh, right before I met my lovely wife, whom uh, has been a guest on the Who Made Y'all Priest podcast. <laughs> I'm sure. um, uh, yeah, shout I'm sure. out to uh, Ia Awo Joke, my lovely wife. Um, I met her two weeks before the storm hit. It was just a crazy whirlwind uh, experience, man. We were living with each other after two weeks of knowing each other. Um, mm-hmm. Spirit literally, or oh, y'all literally pushed us together. Um, uh, through the stint of that, through travels between Virginia and back to New Orleans, to Texas, back to New Orleans, um, it was just this constant ob- observation of life. And uh, we came to a point where things in New Orleans were getting pretty rough for us uh, post-Katrina. And I had lost my job. My wife uh, uh, was closing out from her job. 
and we found ourselves pregnant with our first child after uh, many losses. Mm. And uh, we had some friends of ours out here in Texas. They were like, man, if y'all get out here, um, you know, we'll, we'll hold y'all down and we'll put y'all up. And so we got in with them and everything was going okay. You know what I mean? I'm hunting for a job. I'm trying to get things, you know, um, at this time, you know, studying is kind of on the back burner because I'm in survival mode. The woman who was uh, housing us, um, you know, God bless her. Um, she got put in an awkward position. One of her family members was returning from being incarcerated and the judge would only release him to her care. And Damn. It was it was it was either us or family, and we didn't want to put her in that position. And so, mm -hmm. like, it was just mutually it was like, all right, we got to find a way to make it work. So we ended up leaving them. Um, ended up staying with some more friends, um, and we literally uh, we were sheltered, but you know we didn't have a place of our own. I don't want to be as staunch as to say we were mm -hmm. homeless, but we we were sheltered, but we did not have a place of our own, and um. Man, it was just it just got tougher and tougher and tougher, and literally I'm to the tears. I'm like I'm I, I don't have five dollars in my pocket to, to 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 take my you know take my wife out you know to get something from McDonald's. You know what I mean? She's pregnant with my child. All the time, spirit still. Before I know, before I literally I'm out of frustration, I'm on the highway just driving, and I get off and I exit and I stop at the Home Depot on Voss out here in Houston. And I walk in there and I just walk to the back and I'm just, I'm just shooting for the fences at this point. I'm like, look, I'm whatever y'all have. I don't care if it's, I don't care if I'm, if I'm sweeping floors after hours, if, if there are any open positions, I, I'm letting you know now I'm, I'm, I'm open and available. I walk in, the hiring manager is from New Orleans mm. and she was a transplant from New Orleans post Katrina. And this woman hired me on the spot. So I'm working there for a little while and things kind of get rough with the people we're staying with again. And we're having to find more shelter. It was like, all right, we got to move from this place again. Um, an elder by the name of Thelma Benson, Miss Benson, I will never forget this woman as long as I live. This woman not knowing me from Adam, not knowing my family from Adam. She, 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 she worked front cashier and I worked in Florence. And she said to me, Y'all come stay with me. Me and my wife, pregnant. She didn't know us from nowhere. She just took us in. Enough for us to get Savali here safely. And it was at that time that I had my first divination. Mm -hmm. uh, close dear sister of mine, Sonny Patterson. I was like, look, sis, um, my life is in shambles right now. I don't know what's going on. I, I know you do something different. I see you always wearing these beads for some reason. I'm attracted to them. I don't know what they are. They fly. But I know you do something different. Can, can you can you can you do a reading for me? Can you lead me? Can you can you can you kind of give me some direction? Um, I, I need some help. And so she's like, "Well, you know, I can I can bring you to somebody um, out here in Houston." And that's when I met um, our Oluo, um, Baba uh, Femi, Chief Oba Femi, Femi, Mayo Goon of uh, Ode Remo. Uh, Chief mm -hmm. of OIDSI at my first divination, and at this point, I'm all about. I know there's something bigger, right? I know that I know there's these dealings. I'm studying this whole world of these nature and these spiritual concepts from ancient Egypt and Kemet. So I know there's something different. And I sit on this man's mat, and he proceeds to just tell us all of these things that nobody could know. Mm -hmm. Nobody could know. And I'm a skeptic by nature. Right. Right. You know, to, the, to, the, to this day, as, as an Ifa practitioner, I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical because within Ifa, we're in the realm of knowing, not, you know, believing. And so, right. And, right. and so, and with that, you know, um, I'm like, I don't know, man. I don't know. This, he tells my wife all of this, all of this detailed and beautiful information. He tells us, he gives us these rituals to do. He tells us what we need to do to make sure Savali gets here safely because previous to that, we had had three losses. And mm. If, if, if Savali was going to be the, our last attempt, and we 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 were um, taken by one of our senior chiefs, uh, Chief Kolade, who took care of us and who helped us complete the ritual initially, and then we had some work we had to do on our own, and the blessings of Yemoja, 
uh, granted me my first child. Savali. Sure. And from there, I was like, okay, this is something different. This is something new. And I was still skeptical, but I began to study. I was like, all right, let me see what this E5 thing is about. So I began reading some texts, get my hands on um, a copy of Inner Peace by Awo uh, Falokun Fatumbi. Um, and the concepts to me are just mind blowing. It's like I can clearly align them with a lot of the spiritual concepts coming out of ancient Kemet, which I've been studying for a long time. And it just made sense to me. And if I knew where to get me, if I said, if you, you're not going to believe, if you're not going to believe at first, we got to get you through your study. And it was through the study. Mm -hmm. It was through the acknowledgement and the cross referencing and, um, okay. Learning that Oduduwa was initiated into in the East and okay. What's East of Nigeria. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. we learned about how, how the, how the systems are built on top of each other and how they are, mm -hmm. how they're ancient cross references. And that's how E5 pulled me in. It was through the wisdom, through the study, through the knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, I studied for about three years before we received our hand of E5 in, the, in uh, 2013. And um, five years after myself, my firstborn child and my uh, wife, all receiving our hand of Ifa, I was initiated as a priest of Ifa, uh, mm -hmm. studying under OIDSI and the tutelage of Obafemi and all of our many senior priests who have um who have raised me up to do what I do. I say, I say, that's a hell of a story, man. All of the uh, trials and tribulations that you and your wife had to go through to finally get here man and get on the other side of that that's definitely a beautiful story and a beautiful testimony that's a that's a hell of a testimony about yeah, uh the trajectory that you took you know going through katrina uh you know really basically being homeless like you say you were sheltered but you didn't have a place of your own uh you know you had your wife her being pregnant i can just imagine what your mind what your mind is doing at the time and the things that you're trying to do and possibly the things that you thought about possibly outside of your character just to be able to take care of your family man i understand where your mind was at at the time yeah. I, I, I definitely understand um yeah man the walk in itself um even walking into ifa receiving my first odu from my hand of ifa i can look back on everything from that odu and see how it played out with everything that led me to Ifa. Right. Um, and it's something that I constantly reference and it's something I constantly go back to. And it's something I constantly um, continue to evaluate as my root um, and all of my previous experience that that from 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 childhood that brought me to uh, Baba Femi's Met. Right, wow. Yeah, that's a beautiful story, man. So you talked about you being a teacher. Um, so you are occupying one of the uh, most talked about positions in the American media right now. So uh, how is that How is that going for you right now in 2023? And what are the pros and cons of the position that you hold as a teacher? Um, as a teacher, um, you know, it is a um, it is a rewarding position. Uh, I'm an eighth grade English teacher. I teach middle school. That's kind of my niche. That's where I like to be. Um, I love that age where they um, are aware enough to begin to start formulate their and formulating their own opinions, but they're still green enough to see the to where you can still see the light bulb go off when you introduce them to new things and new ideas, um, and then you can see where they begin to uh, incorporate it into their thought process. Um, uh, structurally, man, um, being a teacher, one of the big pros is definitely the consistency that it allows me um, with all of the other avenues that I travel with in my life. Um, as a father, it gives me consistency with my own children. I'm home with them during, you know, um, vacation times, on weekends, things mm -hmm. like that. And so that consistency of having um, the summers off to be able to uh, spend with them. Um, and, you know, uh, take care of all types of things um, that gives me the time to reinvest in myself spiritually to continue to study and work on the things for myself that I'm working on. Um, 
out here in Texas, man, uh, every 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 teacher needs to be paid more. But out here in Texas, man, um, it does allow you to make some moves um, financially. And so, like, you know, um, the benefits of teaching is that, you know, it, 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 it's, 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 it is one of the most stable jobs um, mm-hmm. that you can have as mm-hmm. far as, like, you know, a profession. Um, I love literature. I love stories. I love poetry. Poetry is my first love. Um, it's what brought me and my wife together. Um, I was a spoken word poet for many years. Um, again, one of those things that's right in line with, you know, spirit leading me to Ifa. Um, uh, and so reading and teaching kids how to engage with the world through critical thinking, speech, communication and analysis, right? Because that's what I'm teaching in the classroom. Like I need, I need them to be able to take those skills and go out into the world and not be made a fool of. Yeah. Um, I need you to be able to analyze situations. I need you to be able to read between the lines. I need you to be able to listen with intent. I need you to be able to process your thoughts articulately when you step out into the world. And so, um, my role as a teacher in a classroom is to uh, facilitate critical thought, to facilitate um, strengthening communication. Um, as a as a reading teacher, that's what I feel like my my role is. Mm-hmm. The cons, unfortunately, are becoming heavier and heavier um, the further you go down the line. Um, I think the biggest thing is. Uh, Parental investment um, has really fallen to the wayside over the years, and it's reflective in the engagement with students. Mm-hmm. Um, when you when you're in a classroom as a teacher, it is within the first ten seconds you know whose parents are involved in their children's learning and whose parents are not involved in their children's learning. And that's one of the, mm. that's one of the, that is the most critical thing when it comes to a child's education. And mm. um, myself being the professional and the partner with the parent mm. in developing their child, at least in that realm, um, it's, uh, it becomes harder the, the less a parent engages with their academic development. Um, that's the hardest hurdle to get over, I would say. So I want to touch base, though, on some of those cons a little bit. So the Texas State Teachers Association during like the 2021-2022 school year did a survey. And about 70% of teachers in that survey said they were seriously considering like just quitting teaching altogether, yeah. right? Absolutely. You know, now I'm sure that the pandemic played a role in skewing those numbers a little bit. But aside from the pandemic and whatever struggles those presented, why do you think those numbers were that high with teachers talking about quitting? Um, We're at a period where your average I'm going to speak from the middle school dynamic. Your average middle schooler, you're talking about ages between 13, talking about ages between 11 and 15, right? Average range for middle school. Students are overexposed to things that impact their perceived maturity. Mm. They're not actually mature, but they think they're mature because of what they're exposed to. And so you have a lot of adult mentalities coming from children Mm. that are in the worst case reinforced by bad parenting um, in the best case, um, 
in the in the best case, they're mature enough to be able to to really dig in and understand. Okay, I need to make some different life choices from where I am right now. Best case scenario. Yeah. So you have a mature, you have a a much more mature acting a uh, younger group of people, right? And so they think they know. And it makes it difficult to try to teach a child who you know is a child, who right. society understands as a child, but in their eyes, when they're away from that parent for those eight plus hours, they think they're grown. They mm. think they're adults. Um, and that creates a a dynamic um, in an educational setting where there is, uh, they do not see teachers as authorities. They do not see administrators as authorities. And so behaviors can run, you know, rampant. And there used to be a bell curve, right? There used to be, you had your pocket of those kids, then you had your average group of students, and then you had your, your exceptional students, right? That bell curve has been flipped upside down. Um, wow. Especially, especially dealing with, um, depending on where you teach and the populations that you serve, um, your average bulk of students, three, four levels behind reading, um, your average bulk of students, parents are disengaged from the learning environment. Um, your, nar your more narrow windows are your students who come to school engaged, wanting to learn, wanting to dive into the information. On the farther end, your kids that really just struggle because they may be dealing with some type of um, learning disability, but they have the gumption and they want to try. So you have your low performing students who want it, your high performing students who want it, and then your massive students are I dare say now, especially in urban areas and underserved areas, underserved when it comes to engagement, have low drive for education, don't see mm. education as a means to promoting um, healthy and prosperous lifestyles. Um, uh, what they are exposed to through music, what they are exposed to through social media, what they are exposed through um, their social engagements, their ideas of what they think society has waiting for them are just, they're just wrong. Right. They see they see an anomaly of a 17-year-old who's gone viral on TikTok and they've made a few dollars and they think that that's the lane for all of them now. Right. And um, it creates, it creates heavy, heavy challenges in the, uh, in the educational uh, world. Wow. Wow. Man, one of the things that I love about not just Ifa, but spirituality, um, African spirituality, is the focus on change, right? And the school system is an old relic. You know, it, it has been what it's been for a very, very long, pretty much since its inception, right? And Oshay you and myself, we talk all the time about not wanting to send our kids to public schools. And, and it's not something I really thought about until I was at that point about making decisions about having a child. And then I started kind of thinking about all these different things. And, and we talked about not wanting to send our our kids to public schools and looking into private schools and even things like the Nation of Islam schools and things of that nature. Because of like the politics and everything, especially now surrounding uh, the school system and we just not wanting, you know, strangers essentially to teach our kids certain values that we feel like that, you know, we want to talk to them uh, about in school. I mean, excuse me, that we want to talk to them about in the home. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that. Like, what do you see as the value in public school? Um, if there is any, you know, maybe you can help convince us that to kind of see something that maybe we don't see because 
it's been forever since we were in school. Oh uh, no, absolutely. Um, so one, I'm a, I'm gonna say this out there, like both of my school age children um, attend public schools. Um, there is absolutely no uh, judgment or denigration about anybody who chooses private school. Um, whatever you choose as a parent in that regard, as long as you are placing your child in an environment that you believe is going to foster them on the levels um, that you require, that's the most important thing. My children attend public mm -hmm. school. Will I allow them? To, will I allow them to attend any public school? Absolutely not. Right. <laughs> and so it's all about um, the level of engagement. Um, it's all about what a child has exposure to. Um, it's about the quality of um, educators that are presented in that in that in that school. Um, it's about the vision of the leaders in that school. It's about the parent engagement at that school. You mm -hmm. have many, many, many. Um, public schools that are outperforming the rest of the country, outperforming other air, other um, you know, at, at performing at very high levels in their states against other states. Um, and unfortunately, you will also have public schools that are uh, being directed uh, in ways that are not conducive to the growth of the student that are not conducive for the needs of the neighborhoods that they're serving. And so as a parent, I have to invest in whatever that decision is. If I have the means to send my child to a private school and I can break them funds off, fine. But guess what? You may get into that public school. I mean, it's, you, may, you, may, and you may enroll your, your, your child into that private school. And then what are those behind the scenes things that you're not aware of at that private school? What is your child, what behaviors are your child being exposed to by the population at that private school? What are the character of those children like at that private school? What are the character of those teachers like at that private school? It doesn't mm -hmm. matter whether it's public or private. It matters that you invest and do your due diligence in making sure that you're sending your, your child in a place that is going to uplift their natural gifts and talents. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Also, and this has always been, my wife was also an educator. We are our child's first teachers. Mm -hmm. Period. Whatever influence, and teachers will have, good teachers, good teachers will have influence. Whatever influence a teacher has with my child, and if they're away at a building in another place for eight hours with their child, they're going to have some level of influence. Minds should be so anchored, so heavy, so weighted that it is the first lens that my child processes anything through. Mm -hmm. My children are all children of Ifa. And so they have an understanding of Iwa Pele. They have an understanding of ancestors. They have an understanding of what it means to be a person engaging with other human beings, right? They have a, they have an understanding of what it means, even on their level, on their on their level, of an alignment between one's head and one heart. And so they take that wherever they go. Hmm. So mm -hmm. if I place them in a, if, I, if I place them in a, in a in a school, my wife and I are going to vet that school. We're going to vet the leaders. We're going to vet down to the school's mission statement and their previous scores. We're going to do that due diligence. My oldest child is an amazing artist. And not just, oh, she's good. She is taking uh, digital artistry classes and animation classes at 12 years old. And we just got her enrolled in, um, into one of the leading middle schools in the Houston area for visual and performing arts, a magnet school 
where she has the ability to double magnet in visual arts and uh, technical theater. Mm. My parent didn't have that level of investment. They sent me to whatever uh, elementary school was just in our area that we were zoned to, right? right? So being my child's first teacher and her biggest cheerleader and her number one um, investor, I have to vet those sources, whether it's a public or a private school, mm -hmm. right? And so um, the school that we chose for her is one that is in alignment with her natural gifts and talents that that also spirit said, if I said, will be in her best alignment. Mm -hmm. So sure. to, to sum up your question, um, vetting the school is the most important thing and a parent must be engaged in what that school is providing to their child, whether it's public or private. Mm -hmm. I say, I say. Uh, so things like sex, politics, uh, religion, um, like those are three subjects that, you know, I personally, and I know Oshayun is the same way, that we don't want the public school system to teach our children. And I'm sure that there are things, whether those three topics or other areas, that you probably find yourself in conflict with as far as how it's taught um, or whether it's taught or not in the school system. How do you personally balance those things out, right? Like, cause I mean, you know, you're an employee of, of the school system. There are certain things that you have to do to, you know, you've got to kind of fall in line, but how do you operate with that? So first of all, um, this is any teacher who, pardon me, cares. Mm -hmm. This is a skill set that must be mastered. Um, a, a, a teacher must know where their personal views, uh, where the where the their personal views end, and the classroom co curriculum begins, and vice versa. Personally. Um, I am very quiet about my personal views, All right? This is a skill that I've had to acquire. Being an eighth grade English teacher, I have a rule in my class that we can discuss anything through an academic lens, right? So take the topic of religion, for example. If someone has a question about religion, First of all, we're going to pull up a source, right? We're going to pull up a source. So this isn't my opinion we're discussing. We're going to look at facts. We're going to look at information on the topic. We are going to engage your curiosity, right? But my personal view of that religion doesn't need to come into question. My personal religion doesn't need to come into question. I can engage that child's curiosity on the topic without interjecting my personal views, right? Mm. And let's take it a step further. If I do choose to share my opinion on something, right? It is very clear, and this is one of the reasons I choose to remain with, so, you know, a little bit with the mature population to an extent, right? Is that, okay, this comes with the caveat that this is Mr. Brewington's opinion. It is that doesn't is not yours. It doesn't need to be yours. And not only that, I'm also going to include other opinions. I'm never going to let my opinion take up all of the space in the conversation, in the room, and whatever the discussion is. And again, right, these are the marks of a seasoned teacher. Yeah. And so a novice teacher may not know how to handle the nuances of engaging with a child's um intellect or uh, curiosity on such a mm -hmm. heavy topic without mistakenly just putting their thoughts out there or putting their own feelings out there or saying, or telling a kid, which is the worst word you should, you can use in a classroom is should, right? I'm never telling a kid what they should do, should think, should believe, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to be rooted in fact, right? So if there's a discussion mm -hmm. on um, religion, Right. Okay. 
we can talk about religion. Here are a list of major world religions. What are the questions you have? Here is where you can search for this information. Now, once you have figured some facts, then we can analyze. Then we can look at those higher Bloom's taxonomy skills that a good teacher would know and say, now let's do an intellectual dance that allows that kid to be able to express their thoughts, that we can engage with their curiosity. But I am not imprinting my personal thoughts and beliefs onto that child to influence and have them go home with what my thoughts and feelings are. Um, yeah. And so it, uh, it's, a it's, a tough, it's a tough thing because one, um, teachers have to learn by trial and error. I don't care what degree you get in education. Once that rubber hits the road and that door room closes and it's just you in front of those kids, it takes time to build that toolbox. It takes time to build that skill set. And I'll be the first to say that is not a skill set that, um, that a novice teacher is going to have. So any parent that does have those concerns, right? Um, you're right to have those concerns. Um, but also trust in a degree, if you have a teacher and it's okay, right? Talk to your kids, teachers, ask them questions. How long have you been doing this? Do you have a degree? Are you certified? That that's where the community gets built in education, mm -hmm. right? That strengthens the whole experience for the child. Right. And so, um, so personally, that's my method. Right. I, I root everything in fact. And I am clear to disclaim what my personal opinion is. I include other opinions and I make sure that my students know that my opinion does not carry the most weight and that you, these are things you need to examine. Go home and talk to your parents about this as well and, and, and examine many avenues of whatever the topic is that we're discussing. No, you are an anomaly. <laughs> you are an anomaly when it comes to that type of thing, because uh, what we seem to see is on the opposite end of the spectrum of that, you know, teachers telling students what they should mm -hmm. believe, how they should think. And this is one of the reasons why I'm skeptical about sending uh at least my young daughter, sending my young daughter to public school because there are some uh, values and beliefs that I want her to be taught that I feel like may not be taught in the public school system. Well, again, I'm going to speak for myself. We are our children's first teachers. Exactly. Mm -hmm. We are our children's first teachers. Um, <laughs> I'll go as far as to tell you I work in a Christian charter school. Mm. <laughs> the environment where, uh, where I have to navigate um, can be somewhat rigid in thought sometimes. Mm. Not necessarily mm -hmm. for the children, right? Um, and it's a very unique place because the middle school is public charter and the elementary is a private Christian. But almost 90% of the students matriculate from the private Christian school to the public charter school. So that mm -hmm. dynamic is very unique. I've never ever seen it anywhere else. Um, <laughs> it is a, again, this is a place that Ifi uh, and Spirit have directed me to be in. Um, and I'm learning my lessons being in this environment about how to navigate differences in thought and differences right. in the way that people see mm -hmm. things. Um, but trust and believe your average teacher wants to see the child successful. And most teachers, I would, I would dare say that most teachers walk in good character. Um, they may not share all of the values that you possess as an EFI practitioner. But those cross sections of, of kindness and humility, those cross sections of uh, care and investment, most teachers carry those things. Mm -hmm. um, you do have some relics who are just there for a check. 
you do have some relics who have been in the game so long that they probably should not be teaching anymore. But if I had to lay out that bell curve, mm -hmm. your average teacher does care for the well-being of that, of that student, and they're not going to misalign or mislead that student in any way that will intentionally um, harm them. Um, sending my children as E5 practitioners out into this public school world, um, it always comes back to discussion. I help my children to process their experiences through the lens of E5. When my child has a certain experience, I'm going to get an old do on it, and we're going to examine it together. Mm -hmm. My child, Savali, is uh, now, she's at, she's 12. She's at the age where she just received her so day, and she's beginning to look at these things now through a lens of Ifa in her own way. Mm -hmm. And so whatever happens on her campus, whether it's from a message from a teacher, an experience with a student, it gets brought back home for process. Mm -hmm. It gets brought back home uh, for analysis. It gets brought to the mat when necessary in order to clarify and, and, mm -hmm. and understand and get the most out of what it was. And I would dare say that should be the case whether your child is in public school or private school. Mm, absolutely. Um, the, the experiences um, that our children have whenever they're away from us um, had a potential to impact them in various ways. Um, and so the root, our practice, our process, being the thing that helps them to navigate those experiences is what allows, I don't, I, it doesn't matter to me where where my children go for, well, it matters, me not, it matters to me where they go, right? But wherever they go, it, it comes back to our practice, our our understanding of life mm -hmm. and the mat to be able to process those experiences. Mm -hmm. I say, I say. Now, uh, a little bit ago, I talked about how the school system is an old relic and it has remained relatively unchanged since um, its uh, creation. But society has changed a lot, mm. you know, and as society changes, that's going to show up at least in the kids that are, you know, that make up the school system, amongst other things, parents as well. So kind of pulling on that sex thing a little bit more, mm. we have seen over the last several years, the LGBT uh, community grow in, in popularity, some would say grow in strength and in influence. And we see that now starting to show up in the school system. And we're seeing, you know, different states trying to pass different things in regards to how do you handle this increasing LGBT community that makes up our school system. So I, I'm seeing in a lot of places where there's like books and other resources and materials associated with um, non-same-sex uh, sex, right? Where before we didn't really, you know, when, when we weren't focusing on heterosexual sex, there wasn't really talk about sex. But now this thing, you know, the LGBT thing is, is happening and, and gaining steam. You see that. Have, have those types of resources and materials and things of that nature made its way into Texas schools? And what are you seeing in regards to that community in school? I know it may be a little bit different in your current location, being that you're in a Christian school, but as you talked about, this isn't your first you know, school that you've been to either. So I think, I think, one, I think we have to acknowledge the fact that homosexuality ain't nothing new. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All of us within our school age, you can think back to middle school, you can remember somebody at that period in time who you knew practiced a gay lifestyle in some way. 
It's, 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 it hasn't it's, it hasn't gone anywhere. I wish I was looking like nah, not me, not at my school. <laughs> <laughs> whether whether or not he know him, they was there. Yeah, right. Right. I believe you. I um, believe you. Um, and uh, and so one is nothing new, right? I think what has happened is that uh, society has become a lot more accepting of um the lifestyle being open and promoted. Um, and I believe that uh, these young children who believe that they may be influenced, who, who believe that they may be ex experiencing um, these different alternative um, draws in their sexuality, they believe that they're experiencing these things, or even if they are experiencing these things, we're in a time where those things are a lot more accepted publicly. And those people, um, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily, maybe even from our, our generation, who are now old enough to write books, who are now old enough to write texts, who are now able to engage in storytelling, um, are producing literature. Um, I'm not a fan of banning any type of book. Um, as a reading teacher, I don't believe in banning any type of book. Um, I, I believe in, I believe in discretion, not censorship. Um, because at one point in time, you weren't going to be able to read a book about Nat Turner. And as a matter of fact, that's another battle that we see in a lot of common Southern states that is happening right now, where certain demographics in their histories are essentially being like eradicated and literature is not wanting to be produced. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not, I'm not in that school that believes that any uh, text should be barred. I do believe discretion should be taken when it comes to engagement with material. Um, if a child is interested in a certain type of book with a particular story and carry, and they have characters that may be of the LGBTQ um, uh, population, that has to come with a conversation, right? Are they reading that book because they're interested in a story or are they reading that book because they feel like they're trying to connect with an experience that they believe that they're having? Right. And this is where I say that, like, parents must become more engaged with their children's educational consumption. Right. Um, there are materials and um, Texas is a state that bans books left and right and not just books that have to do with the LGBTQ um, lifestyle. Catcher in the Rye, banned. Persepolis, banned. To Kill a Mockingbird, banned. Um, books that do not always agree with the populist mindset are always on the chopping block. Um, I believe that a young impressionable mind can be influenced by consuming that level of material. I believe that a parent's influence has to be strong. Mm -hmm. And so if a child, you know, I'm always asking my, my, my daughters, what are you reading? What you reading? What's this book about? And then I'm going to thumb, I'm not only going to ask, I'm going to thumb through it. And if right. I see something in that text that I don't necessarily agree with, you know what? Let me give you an alternative book. Let me give, let me give you a similar story to this. Right. Because what I don't want to do is destroy that child's interest in reading a story. Definitely. And I think that happens too much. I think that happens where we 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 see something we don't agree with and then we just smash it instead of giving an alternative to keep that child engaged, mm -hmm. to show that we actually care about what they're consuming and to continue to invest in the idea of them fulfilling themselves with information right whether it's fictional or whether it's documentary that child is learning something from what they're reading
Mm -hmm. Right? So if I have a conversation and and I have deduced, right, (laughs) that they're engaged with this story that may have LGBTQ characters and they just like the story, I don't have a problem with that. If we're reading a story and you've chosen this book with these characters who live this lifestyle because you believe that you're experiencing something, that's a larger conversation. That's something we need to dive into. As a parent, I need to investigate that and see what's going on with my child. Mm -hmm. I can't blame a book for that. I can't blame a teacher for that. That's a parent's duty. Right. Yeah. So sticking, sticking, sticking with that, especially, you know, it's good for us to uh, have uh, you on as a, as a, not just as a priest to be five, but as a teacher that's actually on the ground in the school system here in Texas. Mm -hmm. Um, We've heard a lot about CRT, critical race theory. We've heard a lot about that. We've heard a lot about them taking CRT out of the curriculum uh, here in Texas or not implementing it at all here in texas what are your what are your thoughts about that either them taking it out or not teaching it at all one i think the majority of people who have a gross misunderstanding of what crt is one i think the majority of people who have a gross misunderstanding of what crt is critical race theory is not taught in anyone's public school here in texas (laughs) flat out is not taught that is an that is a college level analysis and discussion Do we talk about social issues? Yes. Do we teach civics? Do we teach social studies? Do we teach history? Yes. I think people take these monikers and then they will demonize them to push their agenda. If I don't want my, if I don't want my child learning about the tragic history that my ancestors may have afflicted on another group of people, all I have to do is label it as CRT, and I don't have to worry about them learning about it anymore. Covers up my guilt, covers up my shame. Critical race theory is nothing more than examining historical accuracy through the lens of race with with critical thought. That is something I would want my child to be able to do. I would want my child to be able to look at historical experiences and say, wait a minute, the way that they're portraying this does not sound correct. Okay, so we want we want them to look at, we want them to examine any type of theory without critical thought. Is that what we want for our children? I think this moniker, right, this whole this whole idea of not wanting what we are saying, I think what not we, what I think what people are people who are pushing the narrative about critical race theory. What they really do not want is for the history of this country to truly be exposed for what it was to new generations of students. <laughs> That's what I really believe that this is about. I believe by by creating a label, you you can take out take out critical race theory as take out CRT as an acronym and put the Star of David in. Right, this idea of labeling something to make it the opposition. It's been done time and time again throughout history. Right, and so um, personally. I believe every student should engage any any material that they are looking at with critical thought. So to kind of double down on this CRT thing and to also be transparent about uh, what I believe personally, um, I don't think I'm against CRT being taught in the public schools. And I'll, I'll tell you why and then uh you tell me what you think about it we have a system that we claim is oppressive to us as a people as as black americans we have a system the school system being a part of that that we claim is oppressive to us why would we want that same system to teach our children about 
race relations. Why would, why would we want them to do that? The things that you say that our children should be able to do or that we would want them to do, as you said, I think that that is the job of the parent, that the parent teaches the child about race relations. I, as a Black parent, will teach my Black children about race relations here in America. I don't want the system that is that if I claim is oppressive to me to teach my children about race relations. So what do you what do you think about about that, about mm -hmm. the system, the system that we call oppressive, teaching our children how to see themselves in history when it when it uh, comes to race? So, again, I'm going to reiterate the fact that no public school teaches critical race theory doesn't in exist. Texas. Not in, I, well, I can only speak for Texas. I've only taught here in Texas. Mm. Right. Um, as far as, again, uh, what I would not want my child exposed to from uh, a school, right? I go back to my philosophy that I am my child's first teacher. Mm -hmm. The moment your child goes out into the world, they're going to come into, they're going to come in contact with all types of information. Right. Mm -hmm. They're going to come in contact with all types of information, whether it was, whether it was exposed to them in a the classroom, whether it was exposed to them through a conversation with you as the parent. Critical thought should be required. Most definitely. I, I, had I only listened to the narratives of my parents, I would not be very far today. Mm -hmm. I love my parents. My parents took me as far as they could with what they knew. Right. My parents were not professional educators. My parents were not people who were learned in history. My people were my parents were not people who were particularly learned in spirituality. So as the parent, right, as the child coming up under them, had I only relied on what my parents provided, I, I would have been a very dull child. Mm -hmm. Most of us. Most of us, right? Mm -hmm. um, even within this spiritual practice, most of us have broken away from the spiritual practices of our parents and have jumped in headfirst to somebody else with somebody else completely outside and and, and that we've that we have we have we have committed our lives to yes. right and so i don't have a problem with my child being exposed to opposing opinions i don't have a problem with my child being exposed to um different perspectives on a particular historical um, event, right? I believe that you should be able, it is a very high level skill. It is one of the highest level skills that any person can be able to do is to look at something from a different perspective, mm, right? I agree. We have, we have, there's a saying that, that says like perception is reality, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everyone has their own perception of something. Very few people are capable of looking at different perspectives on things. Perceptions and perspectives are two different things, right? One is subjective, right. mm -hmm. one is subjective, right? My perception is subjective. It is the way I see things, right? My perception of something is objective. I have to be able to look at it and say, what is this thing that I'm experiencing without my bias, right? And so my job as a parent is to train my child to be able to do that. Teaching English in the state of Texas, there is a teak in which we teach to look at the difference between facts, opinions, and biases. Right, it's not something that's that's heavily engaged upon enough in classrooms to be able to examine something to determine its its weight. 
Mm-hmm. Whether or not it is, whether or not it is valid. We live in a we live in an era today. These children ha- are exposed and have access to more information than any human being who has ever lived before them. Man. They have access to more information than anyone before them. Things that we had to spend hours digging in texts, they can Google. Any child with gumption does not have to wait for a teacher to teach them anything if they truly want to know about it in this day and age that we live in, right? So being able to handle that and teaching a child to examine that critically, right, and to look at something from a different opinion, even even by looking at the state of a quote unquote oppressive system, what is I want my child to be able to examine this and determine the root of the oppression. Hmm. Right? So for example, I work at a school, a hundred percent black teachers, all black teachers serving all serving black students. Are those children oppressed? How far does it go? When I teach, I teach with love. I teach with with excellence. I teach with the philosophy of igniting interest with igniting critical thought. Any child who leaves my classroom was not oppressed by me. Now, would they be able to look back with what I taught them and say, I can see how this curriculum can be seen as oppressive. Mm -hmm. Analysis, critique, right? That, I I, I always always throw my students off when they come into my classroom, because one of the first questions I ask them in the beginning of the year is, why do you come to school? To learn, to to, to do, because my parents send me here, Okay. When I I tell them you come to school to learn how to learn. Mm. That's the that's my opening philosophy with all of my students. You come mm. to school to learn how to learn. Now, with that, with what I'm giving you, I'm giving you tools for you to be able to process information for yourself. Right. Right. I can't say that that's oppressive. Not as the individual, not as the individual. No, absolutely, but this is so this is what I'm saying, right? Campuses, right. campuses are, are full of teachers who do the majority. I will say again, the majority of teachers have the best interests of a child at heart, and they're mm-hmm. gonna want to see now. Well, does every teacher have the skill set to be able to impart that on a child? That part, maybe not. It takes skill. It takes time. It takes the care to be able to say this is what I want to give a child outside of just what the curriculum says on paper, right? Here's not just the skill, but here's what you're supposed to do with that skill, right? So mm-hmm. when it comes to what a what a teacher may tell my child in a classroom, and I've heard some things come back from my child, right? She's in middle school now, so Molly's in sixth grade. So her little world has been opened up. She's going into seventh grade next year. And the conversations that I hear her come home with, how my 12-year-old realizes that she can't have discussions about religion with certain students because they don't know any better. My 12-year-old is capable of that level of thought. She's always going to be exposed to it. She lives in a world where the majority of people are not Ifa practitioners. Right. So she's always going to have the underdog opinion, she's always going to be in the minority of thought. Well, we don't want to say it. We pray that the ancestors spread all of this to, to help people heal, right? Say, maybe yeah. one day, maybe one day that's not going to be the minority. But as yeah. of now, my child operates as far as thought in society within the minority. And at 12, because mm-hmm. of what I have instilled in her, what her mother has instilled in her, with her other uh, seniors and priests have instilled in her because my child has been part of this community since the age of three years old, who's 12 now. My other children, this is all they know. 
because they have been poured into through this lens, she takes that with her out into the world. Doesn't matter what opinion is shared with her in a classroom, whether it's from a teacher or a student, because it's going to come back to the root. It's going to be processed through the root. And she, at this age, can say, oh, okay, that makes sense. I can buy into that versus, you know what? I don't believe that that's, that that idea is for me. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's only to her level of a 12 year old understanding, but she has that root. And if she continues on the trajectory that she has, she's going to be a well thought out adult, Mm -hmm. regardless of what she's given in class, regardless of this discussion is about race. My child is leaving a school where it's predominantly white. They're not going to have the same discussions during the month of February that other schools are going to have, right? And so now it generates questions in her. We teach her about the history of our ancestors. And because she has that understanding, when she's exposed to those things in school, she has a reference. Mm -hmm. And now we're at the place now where she has deeper questions. Well, what caused this? What caused this? Now we're ready to start digging into some deeper history about our ancestors, looking Mm -hmm. at some documentaries, looking at some documents, talking more about not just what slavery was or what that history was with our ancestors, but now looking at the the root causes of things, Mm -hmm. right? And examining those all for her level of understanding. I say, I say, I love that. I love that. So, unfortunately, we have to have a discussion that um, nobody really wants to think about when we talk about, you know, children. But um, again, as people in the society change, that change around the school system that hasn't changed is now having to deal with things. And one of the, or not even one of the, the the darkest part of that happens to do with this, um, it seems like almost monthly occurrence of school shootings. Um, For you as as a school teacher, as a father who has children in the school system, but also as a priest, do you live in fear of the potential of your kids having um, that experience? You getting a phone call that says, you know, their school was shot up, or you know, an active shooter in your school. And how do you protect yourself, your students, and your children, and your wife, because she is an educator as well? Um, it is an increasing reality where, um, the mental stability of people is big, is having a grander effect on violence. Um, uh, as a teacher, as a father, as a husband, as a priest, um, it is something that must be addressed because first and foremost as um, not only my children's father as their Baba not only as my wife's husband as one of her Baba Lawos my job is to protect them and Mm -hmm. so I don't walk in fear of those situations um, every day. That's not something I walk around with on my shoulder. Is it a danger that's is it, is it a danger that's real? Yes. Is it something I walk in fear about? No. Um, it is a reality that is. Um, like you said, it's it's increased in the where the, the amount that you know mass shootings are happening in. Um, it, it, it's a pause. It, it gives pause. It gives concern when you look at the fragility 
of a lot of these young people um, and the fragility of their young egos. Um, and when it comes mm. to uh, how they could exact violence because their mental state has gone overlooked for so long or they didn't get the care that they needed for so long. Mm -hmm. Because there's always a root to a problem, especially when it comes to a school shooting. Every school shooting could have been prevented. Every school shooting could have been prevented. Everyone. Um, whether, whether it was, whether somebody ignored, somebody ignored the needs of the kid. Um, as a priest, I I work I I work our craft to provide protection for myself, to provide mm -hmm. protection for my for my children, to provide protection for the extent of my space um, that I have control over on my campus, right? My classroom. Mm -hmm. There are things that I keep with me. There are charms that my wife carries. There are charms that we keep in our vehicles. There are charms that I keep in my classroom. Um, not just in the fear of that ultimate um, you know, act of violence, but Ifa teaches us that prevention is better than the cure, period. Mm -hmm. right? And so um, I don't want anything to happen to anyone in my classroom. I don't want anything to happen to my children. I want anything to happen in the vicinity, anybody that I love. And so I do work what I I do work what I work for right. their protection. Whether it's whether it's um whether it's particular charms. Um I do a reading at the beginning of each school year um for the educators within our ELA, particularly because we have a lot of educators within the ELA and we work with all of these little young minds, spirits, all these little young ores. And um, so particularly, I always, I put out a reading at the beginning of every year. So we let Ifa guide um, mm -hmm. how we choose, how we can approach what we do um, in the classroom and with our profession. And oftentimes that will come with um, a ritual to maintain uh, our, our upliftment in, in the array. Um, it will come with um, uh, personal rituals to keep ourselves restored and uh, protected. And so I do work the craft um, in regards to keeping myself safe, keeping my sanity, um, mm -hmm. you know, keeping my space um, uh, with good energy for myself and my students to the best of my ability um, because – you got my you got my juju and then you got the spiritual courts of 20 to you know 30 kids at a time moving so there's a lot to there's a lot of moving uh pieces when you're talking about um the spiritual factors that go into uh, controlling those spaces um and so mm -hmm. I absolutely work those things for my safety my my children's safety my wife's safety and the benefit of my students I say uh to continue the discussion about the uh, school shootings, the increase in these school shootings, there have been talks, and in some states uh, and some cities, they've already uh, seem to be implementing this, where they're talking about possibly arming teachers to harden uh, the schools. Um, what do you what do you fall on that on that issue? What do you think about possibly arming? Um, Teachers, or at least getting armed, uh, whatever you want to call them, police security guards uh, at the school to uh, possibly harden the uh, the schoolhouses and to make it more difficult for someone to shoot up the school. Um, I believe that a trained professional guarding a school is a good thing. I do believe that that professional must first and foremost realize where they are working. If you're a trained professional and you handle a weapon and you don't like kids, don't take an assignment at a school. If you're a trained mm -hmm. professional and you don't have high tolerance and levels of patience, 
don't take a job at a school. If you're a trained professional wielding a weapon and you, for whatever reason, are one of these people who are in that profession and you're actually a fearful person, do not mm-hmm. take a job at a school. I have seen some amazing campus police officers who have built amazing rapport with students, built amazing rapport with with teachers and staff, and who genuinely contribute to that place of learning, engage with students, and create an air of safety. Mm. I have seen that. That is a positive vibe that contributes to a school. I grew up in middle school and elementary school with armed guards. They were always consistent. They didn't they 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 were there every day. They engaged with the students. They became part of the community. That's a positive thing. That's no different from me stepping in to protect my kids in that class on a spiritual level. It's the same thing. Mm-hmm. Right? So that I'm okay with. Untrained people being put in the way of handling a firearm, Mm -hmm. giving a firearm to a teacher just because, no. What if they're trained? Absolutely not. What if they're trained? Being trained and having the mentality to, to navigate that environment are two different things. You have plenty of teachers who are trained to teach and have terrible rapport with students. They might be good as far as their profession deems, but you have terrible soft skills. You have terrible people skills. You can have people who are trained. we got plenty of police officers who are trained Mm -hmm. and go out and do terrible jobs. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm in their environments, in their communities, because they don't contribute to the to the to what that space is really about. Right? So I do not I don't agree with pulling like okay, we're gonna survey teachers in the district and we're gonna see what teachers are interested in entering a program to become trained to handle a weapon on school campuses. I don't agree with that. And I'm going to tell you why I don't agree with that. School districts do not even train teachers to handle children safely in the event of a physical altercation. Mm. (laughs) They don't put teachers through, um, and there are specific trainings um, to safely, like physically handle a child who is being violent. Mm -hmm. Right, without striking, without chokeholds, there are different trainings that people can go through and become certified in to handle children who are, have become violent. They don't put mm-hmm. teachers through that training. I have that training, and I didn't receive that training until I began to work for Dallas County Juvenile. It has been something that has served me as a teacher over the years because I have gone through that training. That training is not given to staff. So if you're not going to train, if you're not training teachers to do something as simple as handle physical altercations, why put teachers through trainings to handle firearms? So mm-hmm. I'm trained to handle a firearm, but I'm not trained to handle a physical altercation. What, what, which one of the trainings is going to kick in in the event of emergency? Hmm. What training is going to kick in when that person loses control of their emotions and they have a 13 year old black male who's six foot two, 200 pounds in front of them. There, it takes more than just being trained. I don't agree with it. I agree with professionals who know how to deescalate. I I agree with professionals who know how to contribute to a learning environment. I don't even want campus cops who are just, you just a cop. I don't even, I don't even want you on the campus because you're, when you see my student 
who's 15 years old, but he's 6'2 and 200 pounds. You're not going to look at him like a like a 15 year old if he goes sideways. You're going to look at him like it like you're going to look at him like an adult that you need to put down. I don't want mm-hmm. you on my campus. So I believe that whatever firearm training needs to happen mm-hmm. needs to also come with de-escalation training, sensitivity training. Edu- understanding the dynamics of an educational environment, right? Mm. Understanding that there's there's what we call um, trauma informed care. If you work on a campus with students, you need to be trained in trauma informed care before you do anything to physically handle a child or handle it or be in the presence of a child with a weapon. There are mm. other things that need to be in place before that. You put those things in place to safely. Um, increase our our safety on a campus i have no problem with it just giving that to a teacher who signs up i'm not with it absolutely that's gonna lead to too many it's the first time a gun gets pulled on a child by a teacher on a campus because that teacher lost control because that teacher took what this child said to them personally those are the teachers, one, who shouldn't be on campuses either way, right? Mm-hmm. But we live in, this is a hard, it's a fast turnover profession. And a lot of times they're going to take babysitters. They're going to take people who could just sit at a desk. They're going to take mm-hmm. people and they're not always mentally equipped to deal with the long haul of being with kids. I believe that um, the vetting of uh, teachers um, and their rapport that they build has to be something that's like duly noted. It is something, pardon me, it is something that is evaluated with teachers. Your engagement with students, your rapport with students is something that is evaluated when it comes to being a teacher. Um, But it it should be more highly valued. Mm -hmm. I say, I say, and I think that's a good place for us to end it. Yeah. Man, this this was an amazing episode. Yeah, um, same. Same. This is something that we've been talking about, uh, O'Shea, you and myself, and this is something that we talked about with you, you know, having you come on and speak with us since the end of season one. So, um, but we had those theme seasons that you know that spirit was leading us to have and and i'm just glad that we were able to get you in this was dope i learned a lot um specifically around critical race theory you know you opened my eyes to that and i learned some things i did not know whatsoever um so thank you for sharing your experiences thank you for sharing your gifts and talents um and your wise words with not only ourselves but with the world um, I appreciate y'all having me. I appreciate um, what you brothers are doing to continue to expand uh, the consciousness, right? Looking at the spiritual side of all of these dynamics that we go through on a day-to-day basis. Um, you know, those of us who do this work, um, we have to engage with society in many different levels. And the more that we can expose uh, different ideas and philosophies and amalgamate that with what spirit puts in front of us, um, we'll all be better off for it. And by doing that, we create a space uh, where we invite spirit into those other avenues. We invite spirit into education. We invite spirit into policing. We invite spirit into the platform for us to have discussion. And so um, I give thanks uh, for you brothers opening up this platform and uh, allowing spirit to work through y'all. And I pray that y'all are continued uh, I pray for y'all's continued blessings uh, in doing what you're doing. I say. I say. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you, brothers. Family, we appreciate you for uh, joining us once again. I know you'll love this episode. Um, I hope you learned as much as we did. You know, we're all on this journey together. It's all about growing, expanding, evolving, and and moving forward, right? You know, let's ask the, the tough questions. And let's listen with the intent to actually understand, right? So 
a lot of dope stuff. We covered a lot of different things. Um, and it just was a beautiful episode. So family, we'll see y'all next week. Please like, subscribe, share. I mean, there's going to be a lot of people that you're going to run into who can listen to this episode. We all know parents. We know teachers. We know students. So, so share this so they all can, you know, see this message and have a dialogue. So thank y'all for joining us. Um, we love you. We appreciate you. We'll see y'all next week. And as always, uh, life is for the living. You know, um, go out and have the experience that you came here to have. And as always, live out loud and on purpose. Peace. Peace. Peace.